So, this is the introduction to Berserk I have had to re-record the most of any of the times I've ever tried to do an introduction for a Berserk video, and I think it's for pretty obvious reasons. Today, we will be covering volumes 40 and 41, 41 being the last volume of Berserk that Kentaro Muro was involved with the creation of. I believe I've been told that even this volume was finished by some of his team after he passed. It's really affecting me. I'm not gonna lie if you're someone who's really sensitive to seeing people get emotional on camera i did cry uh when i first read 41 and i don't know what my reaction is going to be today of course there's going to be the goofs and the gags i'm going to continue to do my best to do a read-along that is fun and engaging through these two yeah i'm feeling things i haven't felt since robert jordan passed and i started reading sanderson's entries into the wheel of time it feels eerily similar to that in a lot of ways even in how the people who have taken over i have caught all the way up to preserve I couldn't stop where 41 ended and I just had to go to where it is, uh, where I can tell like it, it feels just as good in terms of quality. The artist who has taken over Berserk and the team is really doing their best to try and recreate Kentaro Mura's style, uh, but it does still feel different, just like it did with Sanderson, where Sanderson did an absolutely awesome job continuing on Robert Jordan's series, but you could still tell it was different. And there's no right or wrong answer uh, for whether or not a series should be left unfinished, you know, the unfinished masterpiece mystique, or try and deliver the ending uh, that fans really, really want to get. The way I think about it, and I don't think I've ever really talked about this on camera, I always think of if another author comes and picks up a series and delivers an end to the fans, it's like a split timeline. That's how I like to think of it. You are seeing an alternate timeline, which hopefully can deliver a lot of the catharsis you as a fan desire. Yes, you're gonna be left wondering, what would be Kentaro Mura's end. I will get much more into the differences of the artwork presented between Koji Mori and Kentaro Mura uh, once I'm doing volume 42, uh, but those are my last thoughts and I'll get more into that when I start touching on 42, but the art is still great. The story, I'll always be wondering what the small differences are gonna be, but without any further ado, I am extremely excited to get into ba 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 berserk ba 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 berserk ba 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 Berserk! Coffee, check. False persona of constant joy and happiness, check. Berserk book, check. I'm apparently supposed to work on my posture, so. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sitting on this now. I don't know how I'm supposed to not play with it, but we'll get there. Okay. I could review the next section of Berserk, or I could hold me closer, guts, I miss you. You could cut ties with all the lies that you've been living in. And I'm in emotional pain from Berserk. 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 Bam! Back into the berserk. 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 Oh, wait. Berserk. I spent a surprising amount of time this morning trying to find the perfect shirt for today's berserk video. I succeeded in that mission. Berserk. 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 Does it feel wrong to not start it with a good old Berserk? Berserk. Picking up the tone a little bit, you've probably already noticed. Yes, I made a big purchase for Berserk. I may come to regret one day, but sure as hell don't right now. Ugh. Oh, you, you meant the tattoo. No, I, I meant the gargantuan sword that I bought off of Etsy. <laughs> Whenever a series comes to a point where I just decide like, oh, this is in my top of all time, I decide it has to be represented on the bookshelf in some way and to reflect the gargantuan impact I feel Berserk is going to have on my life. And the tattoo to me is kind of like a Berserk bat signal. Half the reason I got it is, of course, cool symbol. It's basic, but it's cool. And also, I love the idea of other Berserk fans seeing me in a distance with that tattoo and being like, that's a Berk fan. And then we get to be friends. <laughs> but let us continue on, strugglers, into volume 
40. Wow, I put way too much sweetener in that. Ugh. Weird note before we get into this, Kentaro Mura just draws very beautiful people. The people within Berserk, I, I don't mean this in any kind of like sexual way, just like objectively, they're gorgeous. He has a way with faces and the curves of the human body that it's just, it's like, a, it's elevated. It's, it's better than reality. <laughs> Men and women, except as I recently learned on stream when we were editing the last Berserk video, Guts doesn't have nipples and he never has. That is a very weird choice. <laughs> but where we left off, Shriek and Lady Farnese were moving through the depths of Casca's mind. Under a black sun, they moved through the desolate wasteland, fighting their way towards the manifestation of Casca's trauma. As they reach a forest of spiny trees, monsters resembling, I, they're cock monsters. I can't, like, I wanna maintain a tone right now, but they literally have openings here and spray I'm, I get what Kentaro Mura's going for, but Jesus, subtlety, my guy. But even with both mages utilizing their magic to the greatest extent, they begin to become overwhelmed as they reach the core. Casca's sprite shows duress as a massive flying beast descends from above, tearing through Shriek's golem. The representation of Guts and the wounded hound struggles in the fight, taking damage. But just then, armor begins to emerge from the hound, and we see the manifestation of Guts become a berserker dog. The hound form of Guts tears through the enemies as Shriek uses tiny golems to continue carrying the coffin further. Even still, the descending beasts around them begin to overwhelm their defenses. Shriek says, we're out of protective measures. But within her mind, a voice says to her, one yet remains within the memories you've cherished all along. Shriek's hat is pulled from her head and a spirit emerges. Mistress! Didn't I say we can meet again in dreams? You've done well to come this far, Shriek. As your teacher, I'm very proud. Now I must bestow a blessing upon my dearest student. Literal goosebumps. Literal goosebumps right now. Flame erupts over the attacking board. Now go to the fragment. We made it. Yes, somehow. But now it's out of reach. What do we do? Please leave that to me, Lady Farty says. Place this beneath the casket. And a massive stone head of like the Inquisitor guy lifts them up to be within reach, which is such a fun solution. And I love the idea that like if Lady Ferdinand wasn't here, Shriek would be like, shit, gotta go home. <laughs> and what is revealed to be at the core of Casca's trauma is the disfigured fetus we have seen so many times before. Okay, I thought the child was an evolved version of this. So now I'm, really confused what exactly we're being told here, but I think it becomes clearer the deeper we go. That's the last fragment? A monster, but it's just like a baby. I don't know why the final fragment has this form, but be prepared. Before, when I was nearly pulled into the Berserker armor, I caught a glimpse of Guts's memories. I'd just as soon never witness them again. What we are about to see is most likely that mad feast. Keep your mind well guarded and we see a portal open into the eclipse. This is what broke Casca, the main cause. You mustn't be overwhelmed, Shriek says. Don't lose sight of yourself. It comes flowing in, Casca's scream, inarticulate, a mind torn asunder. And we see Casca being obliterated into the doll, a heart covered in thorns. The final fragment is a heart. Then if we return this to the doll in the casket, just a moment, Shriek says. Is something wrong? This form it's in. Chances are it carries an anathema. What could this mean? That something terrible will happen if we return it to the doll? I was careless. Me of all people. I was so preoccupied with restoring Casca's sanity. I failed to consider it. An experience so terrifying. If Casca would retain her memory and her sanity, it would mean unimaginable agony for her. Instead, it pushed her beyond her breaking point. There's no guarantee. Your wish will be her wish. This is what he meant. The flying beast returns, descending from above. Oh no! The dog that is guts leaps to intercept it. The two monsters struggle. Realizing this is their only chance, Shriek continues, taking the sprite that is Casca and holding it near the heart. You're afraid, aren't you? Lady Fernie says. Even when you know how helpless you are in the dark, there are times when you cower, unable to move. There's nothing you can do on your own. That's why, like he then did for me, this time, for my own reasons, I'm going to drive away your darkness. Farnese, because I don't want to look back on the days I travel with Casca and you, mistress, and everyone else as meaningless. Yes, true, Shriek says. The corridor of dreams, our whole journey, rather has been about this from the start. 
they place the heart back within the porcelain doll, and it begins to seal. Casca is remade. The sprite descends, entering a compartment underneath the brand. Lady Farnese's last words to the sprite. I'm sure you'll get to see him. A light opens from above, and the hound that is Guts lets out a wailing howl. In the final page, we see Casca's eyes fluttering open. She's back. <laughs> we finally get Casca back. It's happened in volume fucking 40. But we get Casca's return here and now. <clears throat> there is a, a limit, right? So I know I've made a meme out of how long we have waited for Casca's return, and there are certainly angles to it to criticize, but in terms of just making something feel like it has this level of weight, a car crash of narrative value, this long of a journey, being able to bring back Casca, it, it feels equivalent to Frodo's journey with the One Ring almost. It's an epic to bring back Guts's true love, which I didn't think Berserk was a love story, but I don't think you can really not consider it that in some ways when so clearly the motivation for Guts and a large percentage of his party is not only Guts' love for Casca, but the love they all share for each other through their mutual shared trauma and the continued support they're showing they will give each other no matter what. And it's all coming together in a gesture of trust where Guts didn't insist himself to be on this part of the journey yet he is still literally here in spirit. If Casca had been brought back at like Deluxe Edition 7, it would have felt like it was a big deal. But the fact that it's been this long does open it for some areas of being frustrated like I was. But it also guarantees this moment to just feel like a baseball bat to the face. Whew. Without any further ado, I bring to you Casca's Awakening. And we cut to seeing Casca sit up within the mushroom chamber. The leader of the elves say, You did well on your long journey. It has been a mere day for us, but it must have been harsh months, perhaps years in the dream. Miss Casca? Shriek says, I remember, Casca says. Each of you, that girl, Elaine, everything she saw and felt now rests within me. It's good to meet you, Farnese, Shriek, Elvera. Thank you for taking care of me as Elaine for so long. Miss Casca, Lady Farney says. She's spoken, says Elvira. Just call me Casca. And I'd like to call you Farnese and Shriek and Elvira. Well, I guess. Sure, I don't mind. How do you do, Casca, ma'am? <laughs> I love the awkwardness of it because like, I didn't even think about that. Didn't occur to me once that once Casca comes back, there's gonna be this like, oh, we don't know you. Wanna grab a beer sometime? <laughs> this is the true Casca, Shriek thinks. The strength and color of her odd are completely different now. The Casca who traveled with us and Guts' companion, the Casca who was likely a warrior are two different people. Uh, Casca, ma'am. What is the current state of your memory? It's a strange feeling, Casca says. Like I just woke up from a long, deep sleep. Oh my God, saying Casca said? <laughs> I don't know why that makes me so happy. I was dreaming through the girl Elaine of her journey with you all. I had no thoughts or feelings. I was just watching vaguely from a distant darkness. You being present in front of me. It's as if the inhabitants of a dream appeared in reality. One being a witch with an elf in tow and these surroundings suggest this is still a dream. It's real, Shriek says, or we are at least. But what happened when I fell asleep is so muddled. I can clearly remember setting out to rescue Griffith. Past that, nothing. It's like I'm still half asleep. Shriek and Lady Farnese exchange a glance, thinking of the heart wrapped in spines. Don't push yourself. Recall it slowly, Shriek says. You just woke up after all. Guts, Casca says. Do you remember Guts? Tears well in Casca's eyes. I'm not gonna cry. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> um, the look of fondness and care that we see expressed here on Casca, it validates everything Guts has been through as being worth it. The fear of her not remembering, not understanding, not being the person that she was anymore, just washed away. And we fully understand that she knows she is Casca, she understands, and what she felt for Guts is probably just as strong as the day she left, and 
you can do that with just a panel in manga. You don't need to write a big paragraph. You can literally just paint a portrait and let your readers know it's okay. I love this medium so much. Are you done saying hello? The Elf Queen asks. And now, at the end of your long journey, you go to reunite with one who is dear. This is my small gift to you because that dull traveling getup isn't especially romantic. And we see Casca has put in an elven dress. Um, I'm a soldier, Casca protests. Dresses in me. It looks good on you, Shriek reaffirms. Show no mercy. You're beautiful, like a dark elf princess. Uh, okay. I just notified the swordsman using telepathy. He should arrive at the big cherry tree shortly. <laughs> and we see Casca's thoughts as she walks out from the tree. With each step I take, I recall them vividly. Those sad beloved days, the evidence that I am me, Casca, and the days when I was Elaine, unable to think or feel, looking up from below the water's surface, and yet deep within me, there was a faint voice. There's someone I want to see. And we see Guts walking over a hill underneath the blossoms to see Casca. I need a minute. Uh, This is the greatest reunion in fiction. I think I'm just gonna put it that way and we'll move on from here. It is without a doubt the greatest reunion I've ever seen in fiction, period. But as Casca's eyes lay on the black swordsman, a vision of the eclipse strikes at her mind. Images of Griffith's emaciated body. It's berserk, so you can't you can't be happy. There's gotta be a moment of like, oh, you think this is gonna be all good? Ah! No, it's not. From here, we cut to seeing Griffith leading a battle against an army of trolls. His forces decimate the beast, Griffith himself killing the leader of the troll army. Victory is ours! All forces, finish off the enemy! And we see the battlefield is left as a troll graveyard. Griffith commands his army to return to the city, summoning the souls of the fallen soldiers. It's a soothing sight, his lieutenant thinks, no matter how many times I see it. And yeah, I can't imagine a more soothing sight as a soldier than knowing if you die on this battlefield, you will be ushered into the afterlife by the leader you view as a prophet. Like, good God, it's so fucked up. <laughs> but as they encounter a structure that is clearly reminiscent of Stonehenge, Griffith performs an additional miracle, allowing his army to walk through the sky, returning back to Falconia in a matter of moments instead of marching for long, hard days. And it's just really re-emphasized here that all of Griffith's men are essentially being turned into fanatics because they're watching essentially berserk Christ perform miracles before their eyes and lead them to victory against monsters. Like it's actually a logical, fair conclusion for all these people to be like, oh yeah, we're God's soldiers. We're walking in a legend. We're gonna die for this man, no matter what. Like it's such a good reinforcement that puts such a foul taste in your chest. As I said before, berserk just inflicts emotions upon you uh, and it continues to do so even in these smaller beats that are just establishing setup for a conflict with a character down the road but we see griffith gives his medium the praise she desires and that is where volume 40 ends and volume 41 the latest release of the volumes from berserk picks up but we continue with griffith's perspective here watching him discuss issues of leading his kingdom with the council princess charlotte raises her hand having put forward a measure to provide relief for orphans by the state well at first it's met with ridicule from the other council members griffith says we should do it and throughout this council meeting it's essentially set up that griffith is going to start making refugees serve in his military so they can eventually be granted citizenship to falconia and use the military for all kinds of projects to help the citizens throughout the city it's just a lot of showing griffith reinforcing his setup as a ruler and backing up his queen and being supportive of her as well. But calling back to the first empire, Griffith finishes this by saying, so let us show what we too can establish, humanity's realm, a second empire. It's a remark from one of the council members after the meeting is adjourned, to lead a nation and its people, one must have a sublime vision. All of us are entranced by that man's dazzling vision. The medium is once again shown to be jealous as Griffith and Princess Charlotte begin to discuss after the meeting, and the medium is pulled away to not interfere with Griffith and Princess Charlotte's private time. She goes off on a ride on her own, saying, don't come with me, to the lieutenant. We cut to that night as Griffith sits in his bedroom windowsill, thinking to himself, sure enough, it's tonight then. 
and we watch as he vanishes in a blink. We cut to Casca receiving a haircut, finally returning to the form that she finds most comfortable, donning armor and a sword. Sure enough, this feels more right for me. Sir Pico comments, This makes for a very different impression. Don't stare like that. It's embarrassing. Isidro comments that Casca used to be a baby, but... I remember the days when to rescue you, I had to play tag with heretics and Farney's bunch. Yes, it's faint, but I remember, Casca says. You really took good care of me back then, Isidro. Puck. Cut it out. It's ancient history, Isidro says. Casca wonders if the women who took care of her are still okay. She approaches Lady Farnes, saying, I'm especially grateful for you, Miss Farnese. Just Farnese is fine. Whenever I cling to you, I always felt a sense of relief, the way I did with my mother and sisters when I was a child. I think during the journey, you really were both, a mother and an older sister to me. Lady Farnese begins crying. Casca begins thanking Shriek as well. Thank you, Miss Shriek. You saved me from so many crises. You needn't call me Miss, Shriek says. Oh, but that's... I was simply doing my part. It was practically Farnese who did all the looking after, the taking good care of you. Isidro is staring at Casca's blade. So you're seriously a sword fighter, huh, Casca? And a woman at that. So how are your skill? We'll see. Casca begins drawing her blade. I think they're pretty rusty. The sword feels a tad heavy. Which ties into something we touched on in a previous video, where yeah, Casca's like physicality is seriously reduced. In early volumes of Berserk, she was jacked. And I have a thing for muscular women, how you doing? <laughs> so I like that that's being mentioned here, where yeah, her sword feels heavier to her. But her entire skill set hasn't just evaporated as we're about to see. Because through magic, three hollow sets of armor are brought for Casca to train against. She displays impressive skill, obliterating all three. The entire party expresses their awe at her skill. I'm surprised too, honestly, Casca says. Old habits die hard. My body reacted automatically. Isidro asks if he can train with Casca, noting that Guts is so big, it's almost overwhelming to train against him. Casca agrees. Thanks, big sis Casca. Yeah, but with wooden swords, Casca says, because my accuracy is down. She thinks, I guess it's my fate to be big sis. And we see Casca begin sparring with Isidro. Finally, Guts' position is revealed to us. He's hiding behind a tree, out of sight of Casca. Um, are you sure you won't speak with her? Lady Farnese says. Not yet. Guts answers, if she's doing well with the rest of you, that'll do for now. Guts can never stop sacrificing. He can't see the woman he loves after everything he's been through to bring her back because he is connected to the core memories that scarred her. And so again, he is sacrificing a reunion with his true love so that she can have enjoyable moments with his friends. And you know, he's just taking solace in the fact that she's happy and she's safe and she's protected. And that's enough for him because Guts is the best fucking guy on the planet. He may let people die a few too many times, but he's a really sweet boy. Leader of the elves approach. From here, the problem is her own. Will she face him? Or will she wait for time and affinity to heal her? No matter how deep the wounds, Casca can now at least decide for herself. Farnese approaches Casca thinking, I was the one. It was me who put your heart in. I said I was sure you'd see him as I watched you go. However, and we see she brings Casca over to the tree. Guts, Casca calls out. Just stay there and listen. And again, what to talk about? They're talking. They're talking. Guts and Casca are talking. Ah! Then again, what to talk about? You've got good companions, of course. I'm already aware of that. The things during our journey. It's like I was dreaming. I was someone else. It's hazy. Isidoro is really taken to you, Guts says. It's hard to believe you took on an apprentice. Hmm. Never seemed possible back in those days. The way he's contrary is a lot like you, Casca says. Although, his teacher was a little less approachable. But his smooth sword style, it reminds me of Jude. At the mention of the name, images flash before Casca's eyes. She begins to curl up. Cos Guts comes around the tree. Casca's fall into the dirt. Before her, she sees Guts, a monster surrounded by the demons that harmed her. She begins to scream. Guts backs away, walking off as Lady Farnese comforts Casca. However, they still can't see one another. Through the woods, we see the Skull Knight is watching Guts. The next chapter starts with Casca recovering in bed. The elf leader comforts her. You only just awoke from a long, long nightmare. For now, you mustn't push yourself. When I try to touch on the past, Casca says, it's like I've suddenly been brought back to that place. I see it all over again. Casca, don't, Lady Farney says. His face, his voice, I can't handle it. A terrifying shadow gets in the way. Casca begins to shake, but the Queen of the Elves puts her to sleep. With encouragement, 
Lady Farnese begins to leave Casca's side, but unconsciously, Casca's hand reaches out and grabs at her clothing. She relies on you so much, like a security blanket. Never, Lady Farnese said. I'm no such thing. We cut to Lady Farnese attending some witch's training, now in a full witch's garb. Lady Farnese, the religious zealot, walking out for her first berserkian Hogwarts class in full witch's garb. Then Shriek has her own lesson, showing great ability beyond that of the students around her without even using summoning circles. Lady Farnese asks to be taught magic healing. The elf queen answers, let's work hard together for Casca's sake too. Oh, and help me with cleaning sometimes. But the final bit of world information we get is from one of the teachers who says, not all demons are astral world beings. Some were once living humans heroes, and even some who were magic users. My old friend who aided you in your shared dream is one of them. Morda watches all of this. We cut to Guts, training with his sword on a cliffside, sweat dripping down his face as he thinks back to Casca's collapse. What am I supposed to do? What you see at the end of the journey, it isn't necessarily just a beautiful sight, as we are led by causality. You and your weighty way of talking. So, how about it? A while back on that moonlit beach, you gave me that gracious warning. Looks like I didn't need it after all. As you can see, I made it to this island without losing any more pieces. Although, the trip was a little rough. That was luck. Thanks. But don't relax your guard. Causality has yet to converge. Hey, what's that supposed to- It's been a long time, your majesty. No, is Skull Knight along the lines of what you go by now? Or Sir Spooky? Majesty. Yeah, Guts, he, he's the former Emperor. We've known this for a while. You gotta catch up, bud. I recall your face. Your vid son. My name is Gedfring. When I was a child, my father brought me along for several audiences. Now I find myself in a governing role for this village. That clever youngster came far in the world. I thank you. Hey, wait a minute, Guts says. Just how old are you? Yeah, Guts, you're in a place where time moves differently. His age is very literally relative. But Guts is taken with the Skull Knight to visit someone named Hanar, a dwarven craftsman, skilled with his hands, who built the Berserker armor. Very well, Skull Knight says. It will also be a chance to repair the armor. We cut to Morda sleeping on a branch. She's watching as Shriek is getting a lesson in flying brooms. Morda takes her own broom underneath Shriek, and accelerating her lesson, takes her high into the sky, saying, You've flown as a luminous body, haven't you? What are you so scared of now? This isn't the same thing! If I fall, I wind up dead! Look, Morda says, pulling open Shriek's eyes. The wind feels nice, Shriek thinks. So, time for you to see what it can really feel like in full. And they begin zipping around on the brooms. Morda laughing. Shriek. Giving the face of like, I'm on a roller coaster, I'm having fun, but I also could die. <laughs> Not to brag, but when it comes to broom handles, I'm the best in the island. Whenever those pedantic old men bore me to sleep with their lectures, I always tear away like this. You give off a different vibe than the rest of you alleged mages, Morda. A bit roguish, more or less. Everybody holding hands and getting along isn't my cup of tea. I really don't think Morda's being set up to be a villain. I hope not. I think she's just going to be an interesting additional character who's orbiting the story. I, I really hope she's not a villain. She's more interesting to me as like a tertiary protagonist. But they spot Guts, the Skull Knight, and the wizard heading deep into a valley. In the valley, they see some of the witch's protective spells waiting to be unleashed. They come across a witch stirring over a cauldron. Flying brooms and cauldrons. I love how old school these witches are being built. It's just, I, I like old school witches. I really do. Oh, still way too sweet. The old witch looks at Shriek. Oh, you're one of Flora's, aren't you? You're acquainted with my mistress? Morda asks. Did you happen to see old master Goffring and the two knights? They were headed toward the forest of stone just now. And with that direction, Shriek and Morda follow them deeper into the woods. Morda throwing an insincere promise to come back and help the witch. But they watch as a distance as Guts and the Skull Knight approach the dwarf forger. What does a mage want here in the bowels of the earth? Guts thinks back to the other smith he's known. Huh, haven't seen that face in forever. The king, eh? Looks like you're still not resting in peace. That's my craftsmanship for you. You, sir, damn good at your job. <laughs> I will protect you beyond death. That's, that's impressive armor. Your body dies, but your mind's good. Thanks to you, I'm in good health, friend. Good health, huh? Says you inside a coffin. Okay, but he's not a very good salesman. Don't, don't call it a coffin. It's apt but it's not a good sales pitch. He looks at Guts in his armor. I never thought I'd get to see this again, and both at the same time to boot. 
Hanar, as its creator, could you give the youngster a lecture on what it means to don this black armor? That ain't my style. But youngin, from the look of things, you've been using that a heck of a lot. Yeah, guts answers. I've sidestepped death many times thanks to this thing. You have my thanks. Ha, <laughs> no need for all that. You're its owner now, however. Using it ain't necessarily the same as mastering it. In fact, that thing's liable to possess its owner for the sake of consuming him. Let's see. Might as well give it a go. And the dwarf slams a hammer into Guts' chest, causing the armor to activate and consume him. Guts falls to the floor, shrieking. The armor shrieking as it comes over him. Guts! Shriek calls out. What was that? Morta asks. Chains emerge from the walls, holding Guts down. The old mage notices Shriek and Morta. What is it? Shriek asks. What did you do to Guts? They going to torture him? Morta asks. I'd figured I'd give him a look at the bloody memories died into his armor, at how this thing consumed the life of its former owner. And we, we were looking at the, the king when it says that, Sir Spoopy, the Skull Knight, so, you know. If you didn't get it yet, we cut to a visage of memories from the armor from when the Skull Knight wore it. An eclipse is happening around Guts, the Skull Knight approaching members of a mostly unfamiliar god hand. He looks down, seeing a face reminiscent of the Elf Queen. Shriek jumps on Guts in the armor, the metal reflective of the Skull Knight twisting back into the form of the Hound as Shriek pulls it back from Guts' face. Shriek, thanks. How are you one? Guts says. I'm sure, just now, it ended- What you just witnessed, the Skull Knight interjects, was the end of a once foolish king and the beginning of a wraith wandering through the endless night. We cut to them walking through the forest, Guts thinking, I'm sure of it, that was an eclipse. Is he the same as me? Yeah, buddy. That's... Yeah! <laughs> they come to a great hollow. A mausoleum, the older mage says. At the root of this spirit tree, his majesty, Sir Knight's former lover, lies buried. And the Skull Knight looks down at a tombstone covered in markings. Are you here this time? The Elf Queen asks, descending from above, to visit the grave of the Lady Maiden of the Cherry Blossom, Sir Knight. She looks just like her. That moment I touched the armor, I saw her too. Damn. Dana is the very image of that woman. Was the elf queen somehow made through an eclipse? My mind is reeling at the implications of that. I am a harbinger of calamity, a ruin of love and hate, forever bound for one place. I have no desire to bask in the afterglow of bygone days. Now let us be gone, the older mage says, leaving the knight and the queen in privacy, lest we intrude. Excuse me, Shriek says, great guru, hmm? Exactly what sort of connection is there between my mistress and that of Skull Knight? In her youth, your mistress, Flora, was one of the sorceresses who served the Lady Maiden. In those days, the two of them were quite attached, but those feelings were too strong. After that disastrous day, the black sun shone upon the world. My friend Flora violated a taboo, and hence she was banished from the village and left the island. A taboo? Go her, Morta says. <clears throat> but their conversation is interrupted by Isidro playing a prank on many of the witch students. The witches in retaliation cast magic on Isidro. But the confrontation is ended when a frog horse picks up Isidro in his mouth. And I think this is the same kind of creature we saw at a fight in the church a long time ago. I believe so. So it's now been tamed by our Miro friend, Isma. Hey guys, playing tag? Looks like fun. Let me join in too, she says to the creature. That one's a friend, so don't eat him, spit him out. But we see Shriek begins to wonder what taboo her mistress violated to leave the island. We cut to Guts though, pondering under the moon. He approaches the guru. You and Sir Knight seem to be well acquainted. It ain't like that. Well, I do owe him a few, but he's a bad luck skeleton who pops up whenever I'm headed off and spouts off like some kind of prophet. He is not of this world. His state of mind differs from that of people. Only deep love and hate and endless fury are pushing him forward. Perhaps the reason he pays any attention to you at all is that he sees in you a reminder of how he once was. Well, I appreciate the advice. Tenacity is my strong suit. I can't tell whether he's dead or alive. He has no right to criticize me. All the more reason to discern at the verge of death whether your fury will breathe life into you or consume you like hellfire. Guts is left then as petals fall, staring at a distance through a window at Casca talking with Lady Farnese. Guts resumes his training. Discern, verge of death, that's all dandy. But on this breezy island, I've got nothing to do but take naps and swing this around. He walks off before noticing a shape in the shadows. The boy is returned under the full moon. You, how, how come you're here? The child begins climbing on Guts. Hey, Guts goes to return to his party. Guts, we were just about to, where did he? 
Found him out there, Guts says. You found him? If he's here on the island, then he must really be... You must be the Flower Storm Monarch. Damn! You took on that form and showed up where we went to watch over us on our journey. Oh right, you were talking about that. But Denna corrects them. Shriek asks, Huh? You don't know this boy, Denna? He isn't from this island? You got it wrong, Yzma says. You look pretty smug on the ship too, Isidro comments, when you gave that opinion of yours. The boy's not of this island, and obviously connected to the disfigured fetus from before, which I think was fairly apparent. I also really like that Shriek was wrong about this. It adds a sense of like, oh no, that I started feeling even before I got to the big reveal at the end of this chapter. Because it's like, wait, if Shriek's wrong, what is this? But Guts cuts in. Do me a favor. Take him upstairs so we can go see Casca. All right. The boy is brought to Casca. He runs to her, snuggling in her bed. What are you doing here? Casca asks. You remember him, Casca? Yes, I remember. This boy who shows up on nights with a full moon. Full moon? The queen asks. Yes, Shriek says. During our journey, he'd suddenly appear before us on such nights, then disappear come morning. As usual, he sticks to Casca like glue. I was convinced that the elf ruler, that it was you visiting in his form in order to evaluate us. It's true that I was informed regarding your journey, but that was by way of your teacher, Flora's dream oracles. By my mistress? I did also hear about the events during the full moon, so this boy is the one. It's no wonder you had the wrong idea. That boy is no mere child of man. The odd of innocence surrounding him is very similar to that of us elves. The fact that he was able to reach this island, that's proof of no ill intent. He arrived here because the island's affinity guided him. The island's affinity? And when I say island, that includes its inhabitants. In this case, the three of you, Shriek, Farnese, and Casca, us, you are obviously magic users. Farnese wore my old clothes, and Casca wore elven hunting garb. Thus, you three were able to become inhabitants of a sort here. Above all, everyone accepts the three of you. We've been accepted, and so your bond with this child led him here. He seems to have especially strong ties with Casca. And him. And we cut to guts. The next morning, Casca walks downstairs with the child. Morning. Good morning. That was a good morning workout, Isidro says. What gives? It's morning. You didn't vanish this time. Indeed, Shriek says to the boy. Queen chalks it up to the movement of time being different on the island. We see the party spends a day picnicking and having fun, training together and bonding. Guts still maintaining his distance from Casca, but Guts' training highlights an issue. He thinks, I guess I still can't manage without this. Looking at the berserker armor, he sees the child is hiding within it. Hey! Here, he says. What, you thinking you're a knight? What is it with you anyway? Guts pulls the child from the armor, smiling. Supper time is called. Guts says to the boy, go, spend time with her. We cut to Casca sleeping in bed. We cut to Casca in bed, snuggling with the child. Being like this feels completely natural. I remember the sense of nostalgia then. No, I knew him from even before that as Elaine. Affection, sadness, but where from? We then cut into Casca's mind and see an image of her holding the disfigured fetus. And then the reveal is shown to us. She bolts up from bed, the child gone from beside her. We see Guts outside, staring at the child. His eyes widen in shock as the child transforms. Casca? Shriek asks as Casca runs downstairs, and we see a voice is speaking to Guts. I was dreaming on nights of the full moon. I'd become a small child and find myself embraced by nostalgic warmth. But when I wake from the dream, all that remains is a faint sense of loneliness. And we see the child has transformed into Griffith. That too soon fades away, along with a single tear like morning dew. And the final image we see is of Griffith, tears streaking from his face as he turns to confront Guts. And then on the next page, we see Kintaru Mora, 1966 to 2021. The ending message reads, Thank you so much for enjoying Berserk and giving it your ongoing support. Tears of Morning Dew, the final installment printed in 41, is the last manuscript that Kintaro Mura personally inked before his death. The members of Studio Gaga, who for many years have created Berserk alongside Mura, work to their utmost to complete that manuscript, resulting in the publication of this manga volume. With so many pieces of information still pending, we are grateful for you for waiting for so long as for what will become of the manga from here. We apologize. As of now, this still is yet to be decided. As we consider what to do moving forward, 
we feel a keen sense of just how outsized for us this story of Berserk that Mr. Murrah spent over 30 years producing is. We at Young Animal have had a hand in producing Berserk over the years, and if there's one thing that we can say, it's that as we move forward, we will always take into account, first and foremost, what Mr. Murrah would have thought. Finally, to all domestic and international fans, we've read with gratitude all the letters and such you've sent. We'd like to thank you once again for all your enduring and profound love. Young Animal Editorial Department, December of 2021. Uh, give me one moment. I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, death is something I struggle with for my own reasons that I think, you know, like many of us do. It's one of the most common things that people fear, have traumatic experiences with, etc. Um, wow. The fact that this is the final panel as well for this volume, tears in the eyes of Griffith, and that reveal, ah, uh, good God. I, uh, I finished recording about a, five days ago a, a new top 10 list of fantasy series, and I put Berserk pretty high on that list, uh, but after reading these volumes and the final reveal, this reveal, this oh my God reveal that I can't even fully process right now because I'm so sad, um... It bumps it up one more spot. Whatever you see in that video when it drops, I think, next week, just remember to add one to Berserk. Fuck. I've, I'm not trying to ever maintain that Berserk is a perfect series. I've met very few fans of Berserk who would ever try and make that claim. But what I will say is it's a f profoundly special uh, series that was written by someone who, over time, never gave up on their core concept and instead decided to evolve what it was. And in that evolution that feels so reflective of someone's soul, managed to write one of the greatest fantasy epics of any medium. Just full stop. And I think one message from Berserk that we can all agree with applying to the real world completely is that death is an unfair, unforgiving motherfucker. It comes for people who don't deserve it far too soon. Kintaramura was not that old when he passed. And um, I know there are uh, fans across the world moved by his passing. And all I can say is I, I've felt that before with Jordan. Uh, I'm feeling it now. And, uh, and I will be doing plenty of deep dives into various themes and things like that in additional videos. I didn't even think of stopping making Berserk content just because I've caught up. I'll make character deep dives, comparisons to other series. If you like Berserk, read this type videos. Uh, so don't worry if you're a Berserk fan. There is absolutely, it's at least once or twice a month going to still be Berserk content here on the channel. Uh, because as you can probably tell, it is one of the most meaningful things <laughs> For me, uh, I have ever read. But we cannot end on that sour of a note, so I am going to say thank you, everyone, for coming along on this journey with me. We, of course, need to discuss that massive reveal, which I didn't even talk about in the original outro of this video because I got too sad. It seems that the child who appears on Moonlit Nights when they aren't the child on Moonlit Nights is Griffith, who is then using his supernatural fast travel that was set up earlier to flee. The child uses it though, when it appears on Moonlit Nights, to find its mother. The implications of this are absolutely insane. We have it said that Griffith wouldn't have been able to come on the island possibly because it had to be the child that was welcomed in by the inhabitants of the party. But no, 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 Griffith then is in once the time shifting means that yes, after days of being there, he is revealed once again. Again, and oh my god, I do think if he really wanted to get to the island, he probably could have just obliterated his way in regardless, but now uh, he doesn't even have to do that. And what we see happen next, which we will cover in the next video, is straight up nightmare fuel, which yes, getting into more meta around the series, the new art style kind of leans into with the darker shading, so I have a lot of thoughts on that. And good god, uh, this is one of the most shocking <laughs> reveals. I've ever experienced and it's set up in so many ways and it makes you recontextualize and think about so many moments with this boy. The fact that the boy was trying to get into the berserker armor for a moment was also, you can read into that and I'm sure we'll get things later. If I had to get into more of the conjecture territory on my part, which, oh my God, I'm finally caught up with you all and so I can 
put forward conjecture out there that could be wrong, could be right. Uh, I would think the child is going to somehow be involved with Griffith's downfall, of course. I've seen a lot of people saying the Behelet is going to be for Casca, but something that could be so utterly terrifying and break my brain in terms of the implications would be what if the Behelet is for the boy? Someone who isn't even able to speak right? What would they do? Oh my god, I have no idea. Can people who have been sacrificed even use a Behelet? Someone asked me that and I didn't even have a proper answer. It's all so scary. And then that's not even getting into, good god, there's so much around Skull Knight and implications for how he possibly inadvertently ended up making the elf queen with his sacrifice? How in the f does that work? I need to get some cork boards and string immediately. But for the last time in a while, this has been your latest episode of Berserk. Like and subscribe if you have not already, and hit the Patreon if you like to support what I do here. We have a special piece of Berserk inspired merch uh, coming out for our spring drop just to celebrate finally getting to this point. Uh, so look forward to that being announced in the channel soon and have a good one, y'all. I got books too. That's the thing I'm supposed to say. Bye.